I'm Elliot Forrest, in for Leonard Lopate today. Discussions of Bangladesh are often pushed aside in favor of its more well-known neighbors like India and Pakistan, but its story deserves to be told as well. Tamima Anam is doing so. Her first book, set during Bangladesh's 1971 War of Independence, won the Commonwealth Writer's Prize for Best First Book. The Good Muslim, published by Harper last month, is the second book in her Bengal trilogy although it can be read all on its own without having to read the first book, if you don't want. Welcome, Tamima. Good to see you. Hi. It's nice to be here. You were born in Bangladesh. I was. But lived in a lot of places. Tell us about that. I did, including New York, which is where I picked up this accent. (laughs) People are often very confused um, because I no longer live in America. But my dad worked for the U.N., so we moved all over the world. And um, we lived in Thailand and Paris and several years in New York. The the background for your new uh, book, for your novel, is the independence war uh, for Bangladesh. I'm pretty sure people are not up on their Bangladeshi history. Why don't you give us just a little context, time period, uh, before we get into the story? Sure. Well, you know, Bangladesh used to be a part of Pakistan, it used to be called East Pakistan. Um, and if you look at a map, it's a very strange configuration because there's a whole swath of India between Bangladesh and Pakistan. But when the British left, they created this country that was East and West Pakistan because there was a high concentration of Muslims in those areas. So the idea was that it was going to be a Muslim country um, as opposed to India, which was so supposed to be a Hindu slash secular country. Um, And of course, this didn't work because the two wings of the country had nothing in common. They didn't speak the same language. They only had religion in common, and this was not enough to keep them together. So in 1971, over a brutal nine-month war of independence, Bangladesh became its own country, and we have been ever since for the last 40 years. And where where were you at that time period and, and your family dynamic? Well, my parents and many people of their generation were involved in the war. Um, So I did a lot of interviews with family members and and other relatives um, for both of these novels. I wasn't born at the time, so um, for me it was kind of, you know, learning about my history and reclaiming a piece of that past, um, which I did. And people really were eager to talk about it because, as you were saying, it's not a war that's really talked about that much these days. Uh, The international nature of your life, do you feel Bangladeshi? I do. Um, So, you know, sometimes it's easier to be uh, fond of a place when you don't live there. Um, And a lot of my friends who live in Bangladesh are confronted with many of the kind of political and even practical problems of living in this huge third world, you know, um, megalopolis. Um, And I can sort of uh, visit Bangladesh and and have these very fond memories of my childhood um, and, and love it very much from a distance. I, I don't even know. I mean, I know there's Little Italy and Chinatown. Is there a Bangladesh presence, a strong Bangladesh presence, say here in New York or some of the arts, other large cities you've lived in? Oh, absolutely. There is um, in New York, in Queens. Uh, there's a big Bangladeshi population in Queens. Um, there is uh, a huge Bangladeshi population in London. There's a part of London that's called Bangla Town, where all the streets are in Bengali and there are a lot of Bangladeshi restaurants. So And Jackson Heights in New York, of course. What drew you to write about this time period? And we're talking about the early 70s here. Well, you know, if you come from a place like Bangladesh and there's been this enormous kind of seminal moment. It's very attractive to write about it because everyone talks about that as the kind of founding origins of the country. And it's not just kind of of interest to me historically, but also stories about war um, are so compelling. They're so full of drama. And when I went to Bangladesh and interviewed people, they didn't just tell me stories about fighting in battles. They told me stories about falling in love in times of war and having children and how their families were torn apart and came back together. So for a novelist, it really is a very rich um, scene. And uh, you you wrote this in English. I did, indeed. But you probably speak several other languages. A few, but English is my my best language. Uh, And was that the original intent, then, that you wanted this to be an English book uh, for for English speakers, then? Yes, absolutely. I mean, the book has been translated into many languages, including Bengali, um, but I was educated in English, and I I also wanted the book to to reach a, a wider audience, so I wrote it in English. The story, The Good Muslim, the novel we're talking about, is a novel, and it's about a brother and sister. Do do you have siblings? I do. I have a younger sister, but I don't have a brother. (laughs) So what made you decide to write about this this sister-brother relationship particularly? Well, you know, this story is about uh, these two people who have both lived through a traumatic event. Um, And at the end of the war, um, you know, one of the the, the brother character has just fought in the war and the sister has worked in a refugee camp and seen some horrible kind of, um, you know, terrible scenes of violence. And they both come out of the war and they're asking themselves what they're going to do 
with the rest of their lives. And the brother chooses religion, and the sister chooses a very secular, very progressive. She becomes a feminist and a crusading doctor. So it's about the conflict, um, these two worldviews kind of clashing, these two moral ideologies clashing, but in the space, this intimate space of the family. And uh, the sister's name is Maya. Uh, Why does she have such a hard time with her brother's religious outlook? Well, it's interesting. I mean, when you think about Muslim communities, sometimes it's easy to imagine that everyone has the same relationship to their faith. But in fact, um, in a place like Bangladesh, where there are, where the majority of people are Muslim, there are a lot of fierce debates about what it means to be a Muslim. And some people really reject that identity and others embrace it. Um, so this is a very kind of typical portrayal, even within one family, um, that, that one character, Sohail, takes his religion to a very extreme place. But his sister, even though she is by birth a Muslim, um, really rejects that because she has a different sense of who she is and what her identity is made of. I'm Elliot Forrest in for Leonard Lopate. Today my guest is Tamima Anam. Her book is called The Good Muslim. At the heart of it, uh, all the specifics aside, is it really about uh, one sibling really trying to regain a relationship with another sibling? I suppose the question is, given that they have grown so distant on the basis of these two different paths that they've chosen, is it possible for them to reconcile? And um, when the book opens, the Maya returns to, to the city after a long absence, and she tries to reconnect with her brother. And one of the ways she tries to do that is through his son, Zaid. Um, she takes this little boy under her wing. Um, and you wonder, are they going to be able to have a reconciliation? That's the central question in the book. And is it the the the, the brother Sohail Sohail doesn't pay a lot of attention to to his son? Why is that? That's right. Well, he really believes he's a, a charismatic religious leader, and he really believes that his whole life energy should be put towards um, you know devoting himself to his congregation, and that people should not be so concerned with the life. The, the, the earthly life, um, and he's thinking about the afterlife. So his head is kind of in the clouds, and he's, you know, he's a zealot in his way, and so his f- son gets neglected, and that's, you know, that's where his sister comes in, and she tries to take the son under her wing, and she thinks maybe this is a way for her to reconnect with her brother. And the congregation that you describe is in their house. How, that's right. How common is that? Well, I mean, it's a you know it's a slightly kind of novelistic plot thing where you know so Hale has this congregation on on the roof of his mother's house, and this is where he does all of his preaching. Um, and you know, it's possible that there are these sort of smaller um, religious groupings. Um, it happens everywhere in the world. You know, church meetings or people having services and and readings from holy books in their homes, and that's how so Hale starts his movement. And the role, I don't really know the role of women in, in Bangladesh. The fact that the sister becomes a doctor, is that unusual? No, not at all. Um, Bangladesh is a Muslim country, but a, a very progressive Muslim country. And it wouldn't have been unusual for a woman of Maya's generation to um, to become a doctor. Um, we have a very strong feminist movement in Bangladesh, and a lot of women work outside the home. But she does encounter some hate in these villages. Absolutely. There are uh, very conservative elements of those sort of rural populations. Um, And I think that Maya is a a particularly um, sort of outspoken character. Um, She, you know, she she's she could have been of her generation, like my mother's generation of, you know, going out and working in the villages. But I made her particularly outspoken and particularly stubborn. So she gets into a lot of trouble throughout the book. And uh, the horror uh, uh, of her life is is what she does on a regular basis. And uh, there's a word in, in the book, uh, Bironga? Birangona. Uh, tell us what that is. Well, um, after the Bangladesh War, it was discovered that the Pakistan army had conducted a campaign of sexual violence against um, Bangladeshi women. Um, and so in order to encourage people um, to see these women as being kind of as heroines, um, the first prime minister of Bangladesh, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, renamed them Biranganas. And Birangana means female heroine in Bengali. Um, so he wanted these women who had been raped and brutalized throughout the war to be embraced back into their families. And Maya um, works with some of these women in the book. And um, so she she feels very, very, very connected to that to that moment of history and also to those women in particular. Was that a big part of wanting to write this book is to throw some light on that particular uh, horrible aspect of the war? 
Well, you know, the more I found out about the war, the more I realized that, as in many wars, the episodes of sexual violence are the ones that people talk about the least. Um, so I did want to. Why do you think that, that is? Well, I mean, you know, it's much easier to talk about a kind of, you know, soldiers fighting one another. I mean, these are the sort of really, really dirty and kind of unspeakable acts that happen in wartime. Um, and we're only now really realizing the extent of that violence. These women were not only raped, some of them actually got pregnant. Were these children of these rapes accepted into the community or shunned? I think for the most part they were shunned. And um, one of the things that Maya does in the book is she works in a hospital where a lot of these babies were aborted. Um, and they were these women were encouraged uh, not to have these babies because they were kind of the the seeds, the result of, of rape. Um, a, a lot of children were born. Some were adopted. Um, in fact, I, I was doing a, a book tour with my last book, and I met um, some some you know people who are adults now. They were children at the time who were adopted right after the 1971 war. Uh, a madrasa is what? A madrasa is a school in which the medium of instruction is Arabic and in which the Quran is um, taught, memorized, and recited, and um, other aspects of Islamic life and practice are taught. And uh, the son in your novel, The Good Muslim, go goes there. What's the significance uh, uh, of the madrasa here? Well, it's really the moment in which Maya and Sohail completely break from one another because um, Maya tries to encourage her brother to send this little boy to school. And his reply is that he's going to send him to a madrasa that's very far away and very remote. Um, and he believes that the child is going to receive the best possible religious education at this place. And his sister vehemently disagrees. And so that becomes the kind of the moment when you feel like it's never the twain shall meet. And what happens to the son there? What's his experiences? Well, I don't want to give away the ending, um, but the madrasa was is not portrayed in a very flattering light in this book because, um, you know, I'm sure there are madrasas which, which uh, you know, are, are kind to the students. And But this particular madrasa um, is sort of run like a military academy. And so the, the child is, is really traumatized and... Um, you know, so it's 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 a terrible place. There's one more character we haven't touched on, and that is uh, the brother and the sister's mother. Uh, tell us about her and how these two very different children could come from uh, from her parenting. Well, I suppose that um, you know the reason I gave this book the title "The Good Muslim" is that you're supposed to ask yourself who in the book is the good Muslim. Is it the character who believes? Um, I was going to ask you that. <laughs> yeah, and it's it's uh, it's a kind of provocative title. So, um, is it the character who devotes his life to his faith? Is it the character who completely rejects her faith? And of course, there's Rihanna, who's the mother in the middle, and she's kind of balancing between the two. She's deeply, fa you know, of the faith, um, but it's not her only identity. Um, so in a way, she kind of represents the balance between the two. Uh, this is uh, the second book in the trilogy. Are the same characters in the first book? Some of them are. It's about three generations um, of this family. Um, so the first novel was focused on Rehana's life, and, and it took place during the war. And this is, um, novel is about her children, and the third will be about the next generation. The third carries it from there. That's right. Best of luck to you. This was uh, great. I really enjoyed it. It was very educational, too. It is a part of the world I think a lot of people don't know a lot about. Uh, I've been speaking with Tamima Anam. Her uh, a novel is called The Good Muslim, which is published by Harper. Uh, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. It's been a pleasure.